So I'd like to give you a brief introduction uh, to a technique called three-dimensional x-ray microscopy. Now this is an imaging technique uh, that uses x-rays in order to create three-dimensional models uh, of a material, both its external structure, but also its internal structure. Now you may have heard before of a technique called com computed tomography, or CT. This is used a lot in the medical field in order to get information about our bodies. Now a conventional medical CT scanner may get you about 250 to 500 microns of resolution. And this is sufficient when imaging a very large object and when we're looking uh, for very large objects. But as we start to examine smaller specimens, you can see that even reducing uh, that resolution, say here, to around 6.5 microns in a micro CT experiment, uh, it's an insufficient. Certainly, that 250 to 500 microns would give us almost no usable information. Now, by further reducing that resolution, in this case to submicron zone, we're able to clearly see details of the specimen, uh, in this case a small animal. And one thing I'd like to remind you is that the image that we're looking at is only a subset of the data that's available. Uh, these are two-dimensional uh, images of the objects, but truthfully there's a full three-dimensional model where you can rotate and examine and change the density distributions that you're looking at in order to get a more complete view of the specimen in its entirety. Now, how is this accomplished? Well, in the case of a micro CT scanner, what we do first is we kind of change the way that we do the scan. In the case of the medical CT, uh, the person would be laying stationary while the instrument moves around them. In the case here of micro CT, the specimen will actually rotate while the source and the detector stay stable in a single position. We will then illuminate it with x-rays, and we can see the internal structure. Now in this case, you can see one benefit of using x-rays. We start with that very small origin in the x-ray source, which then expands. They call this the cone beam projection geometry. And this affords us some magnification. By placing the object closer to the source, we are able to achieve even higher magnification and get higher resolution in terms of imaging the specimen itself. Placing the specimen closer to the detector will yield a larger field of view, the ability in order to uh, see larger objects in their entirety. Now, from a single projection like this, of course, you can get a plethora of information on what is contained in the specimen, but we can also be hiding information of its internal structure. If we then take that specimen, though, and we rotate it, and while rotating it, we collect a series of projection images we can then perform a reconstruction of the entire internal structure of the original specimen. And in this case, we can then see not only highly detailed information of the surfaces, but also of that internal construction. Now, in this case, this is a simple pharmaceutical pill where we might be interested in something like the distribution of active ingredients uh, or the thickness, of, say, of the external coating. But you can imagine it's something in your collection right now, either. Uh, you may be able to uncover some internal information that up to this point has remained hidden. Now, how many projection images you collect kind of directly correlates to the quality of the resulting model. Now, as you can see in those first images, everything very blurry, not able to see a lot. But as we get into the hundreds and then thousands of uh, projection images, you can see how that reconstruction algorithm can fully recreate the specimen as it stands, in this case, uh, walnut. So how that projection uh, reconstruction occurs is that the, it's going to create a series of slices uh, of the original model, and each of those slices will have a certain resolution in it. So we'd refer to those as pixels, you know, and the resolution is defined by the size of the pixel. But in addition, we're going to create mul a multitude of these slices. And those slices are then going to be stacked. And that creates what's called a volumetric pixel, then, or a voxel. In the case of micro CT, uh, for materials research purposes, these are cubic pixels. Now, each pixel is also assigned a color value. In the case of an 8-bit pixel depth, we are going to see about 255 gradations of that color but well, you could extend this all the way up to 16-bit depth and get a much finer gradation and a much clearer picture of what's going on. Uh, in that case, the models just will take up a bit more space on the hard drive. 
Now what do those colors actually correspond to? Well, they are not coming from the actual colors of the objects themselves as we see them. But rather, this is the attenuation of x-rays as it traverses through the specimen. And the very first effect that can, that can do this, one of the more prominent, is going to be the elemental species that are present. In the case of things like iron, it's a highly absorbing material for x-rays. And there we're going to see a lot of absorption. So in these images, the convention is that those are very bright and brightly shown. Meanwhile, anything that has a very low absorption, for example, the air that is around this rock or the inside the pores themselves, that's going to be a darker color or a black. Anything that's in the intermediate, in this case, the feldspars and the quartz, that's going to have a grayscale that kind of corresponds to that distribution of its attenuation coefficient. Now this not only though is affected uh, by the elemental species themselves, but also the density of the material. So in this case, all of the material is made of the same. It is calcium carbonate. So here we see this is a lot of shell and, and such, but different portions of it have a different density, so physical density. And that leads to a different attenuation. Another thing to think about though is the thickness of objects inside. Of course the thicker and heavier that object is, then the more it's going to be in terms of its attenuation. And there is a limit. So when we're using the x-rays here, we use them in the order of about 100 kilovolts to 160 kilovolts. And in that range, uh, we can shoot through things that, for example, are of organic composition. We can also shoot through very, very light metallic materials. And of course, any ceramics or pottery is something that's very easy to image. But we do, we should take these things into consideration when selecting the size of the specimen and also the ultimate solution in terms of the instrument itself. Now this analysis is not only qualitative in nature. It does, it's not just a matter of this area is denser or that. But we can actually start to segment it based on that x-ray attenuation. So if we take those images, those reconstructed slices, we then segment it based on that x-ray attenuation or roughly the density, we are then able to start to extract out quantitative information about the size of objects, about the size of the objects of different density too. So we could determine, for example, uh, the size of different straw that may be inside of a pottery sample that was used for its temper. And by now having into access to that quantitative information, we can start to make relativistic comparisons to samples that may be collected from different sites around the globe and start to draw some comparisons and draw some connections in how those materials or those samples may have been created in similar ways. So x-ray microscopy really affords you uh, a few really key benefits. And the first being that three-dimensional view of the interior of an object without the need of physically slicing it. This also comes with the benefit of being able to take these models after you've created them, printing them out, and then distributing that around the world. So we can start to share more of our cultural heritage objects. No longer do you just have to visit the museum to see the object. We can actually send those models around the world uh, and maybe get a closer look, a more tactile look, in the three-dimensional representation. One thing to keep in mind, not only can we represent the exterior again, surface, but also the interior properly. In addition, by using the software we can selectively visualize certain components in the material. So we're able to cut away portions that we may not be interested in, or if we want to create a better view of a selected area, uh, we can do that within the software. Next we can create that both qualitative and quantitative aspect to our analysis. Uh, so by that bringing the quantitative aspect in, again, that gives us the ability to create relative comparisons to other objects that may be existing in collections across the globe. And lastly, but perhaps most important in the cultural heritage scheme, when we want to keep the samples as pristine as possible, protect them for future generations, this method is fully non-destructive. So you place the object in there, and when it comes out, we don't have to worry about the x-rays causing any damage or any change to the materials. This is also an interesting aspect when we start to think about our conventional methods of conservation, where we may, our first approach may be to carefully clean an object. But in that cleaning, we may also remove important information. So by first performing x-ray microscopy analysis, that can guide your conservation efforts and make sure that we avoid damaging or removing any important objects, such as that might be embedded in the corrosion of a metallic object. And to give you a few examples of the technique, here we have a uh, core that was collected from a chalk mine. 
And in this case, you get a very nice exterior view, certainly, that will preserve that information uh, for generations to come. But with x-ray microscopy, we can also remove the physical bit and leave the pore structure. Here we can visualize this as a connected pore structure. What is the distribution of the pores? In fact, the coloration that we're seeing in those pores corresponds to their size, the blue being smaller and the red being the uh, largest pores. In the field of paleontology, uh, we can start to look at these embedded fossils without having to remove them from their matrix material, in this case an insect. So by taking this image, we can get a very clear view of the insect itself, of its careful features. We can do cross-sectioning without having to destroy the specimen. In fact, we can even print this out and enlarge it so that we can take a closer examination of a creature which existed a long time ago. And the last example I wanted to show you is sort of interesting. So this is actually a maize plant uh, with its roots entangled into soil and rocks. So in this case, the sample itself could be the plant or the sample could be something that's actually entangled in the roots. But by using this technique, we are able to guide that effort of closer examination cutting away, say, the rock or the material that we're not interested in and start to reveal the structure itself. In fact, an interesting detail here on the right model where we're showing the maze, you can see that very, very bright object in the bottom, which it's likely in this case a heavy mineral, but you can imagine if that was an artifact that was entangled in the roots, this might help to guide that effort of uh, seeing what the object is and then leading our efforts in terms of proper conservation. Now, X-ray microscopes, they come in all shapes and sizes, ranging from bench tops to full standing units. Uh, it really depends on the needs of uh, the experiment. Probably one of the most useful instruments is the one here labeled the Skyscan 1273, which can take objects that are fairly large. In fact, its sample capacity is almost the size of a five gallon bucket. Um, so very large objects can be inserted. Uh, and it still has very good resolution on the order of about five microns in terms of its imaging. So, uh, that machine really is a perfect fit, being able to easily fit in the lab and also fit a lot of um, the materials and objects that we're interested in scanning. So thank you for joining, and I hope that you've learned some uh, interesting lessons about x-ray microscopy.